Well, today's program has been fascinating, but I'm happy to say it is not yet finished. President Obama set the stage for today's summit when he visited Senegal, Tanzania, and South Africa last year. In Cape Town, if you remember, he pledged to transition America's support for Africa from aid and charity to opportunity and empowerment. And we're all here to help deliver on that very promise. In recent years, his administration has made real progress. U.S. exports are now at an all-time high and improving every single year. President Obama has worked with our Overseas Private Investment Corporation to triple its investments in Africa. He launched the Trade Africa Initiative, a treaty that has already dramatically increased our trade finance while encouraging American businesses to operate there. And he has introduced Power Africa, a program to double access to electricity in the sub-Sahara regions. President Obama has taken these steps and many others because he understands, as well as anybody, that the relationship between Africa and the United States is not a zero-sum game. He knows that selling airplanes, solar panels, and other goods to Africa creates jobs in America as well. And that's why he's brought us all here to spur growth in Africa and America. And it's why I share his excitement for what we can accomplish together. We're going to hear from him now, and afterwards, he will sit down with a young tech entrepreneur named Tekunda Gonzo for a conversation about how we can spur growth in both Africa and America. You should also know that yesterday, President Obama celebrated his birthday. Uh, oh, you can say happy birthday when you see him. And having all of you here is undoubtedly one of the best gifts he could receive, other than the gifts that I'm sure his daughters gave him. So with that, it's my great honor to introduce the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, to Mayor Bloomberg, thank you, not only for the kind introduction, uh, but to Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, as our co-host, uh, and for the great work that you're doing uh, across Africa to help create jobs and promote public health, encourage entrepreneurship, especially women. Uh, so thank you very much, Michael, uh, for your leadership. Um, I want to thank our other co-host, my great friend and tireless Commerce Secretary, Penny Pritzker. I want to welcome all of our partners who are joining us from across Africa, heads of state and government, and let me welcome the delegations from Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, with whom we are working so urgently to control the Ebola outbreak and whose citizens are in our thoughts and prayers today. I also want to uh, welcome uh, Madam Chairperson uh, Lamini Zuma of the African Union Commission, uh, President of the African Development Bank, uh, Donald uh, Keburuka, as well as the President of the World Bank, Dr. Give, uh, Jim Kim. Please give them all a round of applause. And I want to acknowledge members of Congress who are here and who are such great champions of Africa's engagement with uh, America's engagement with Africa. You know, in a city that does not always agree on much these days, uh, there is broad bipartisan agreement that a secure, prosperous, and self-reliant Africa is in the national interest of the United States. And most of all, I want to thank all of you, the business leaders, the entrepreneurs, both from the United States and from across Africa who are creating jobs and opportunity for our people every single day. And I want to acknowledge my uh, leaders from across my administration who, like Penny, uh, are your partners, including our U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman, uh, USAID Administrator Raj Shah, and our new head of the Millennial Ch uh, Challenge Corporation, uh, Dana Hyde, uh, President of the Export-Import uh, Bank, Fred Hochberg, Director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, Lee Zak, and our President and CEO of OPEC, Elizabeth Littlefield. 
So we are here, uh, of course, as part of the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, the largest gathering any American president has ever hosted with African heads of state and government. And this summit reflects a perspective that has guided my approach to Africa as president. Even as Africa continues to face enormous challenges, even as too many Africans still endure poverty and conflict, hunger and disease, even as we work together to meet those challenges, we cannot lose sight of the new Africa that's emerging. We all know what makes Africa such an extraordinary opportunity. Some of the fastest growing economies in the world, a growing middle class, expanding sectors like manufacturing and retail, one of the fastest growing telecommunications markets in the world. More governments are reforming, attracting a record level of foreign investment. It is the youngest and fastest growing continent with young people that are full of dreams and ambition. You know, last year in uh, South Africa, uh, in Soweto, I held a town hall with young men and women from across the continent, including some who joined us by video from uh, Uganda. And one young Ugandan woman spoke for many Africans when she said to me, we are looking to the world for equal business partners and commitments, and not necessarily aid. We want to do business at home and be the ones to own our own markets. That's a sentiment we hear over and over again. When I was traveling throughout Africa last year, what I heard was the desire of Africans not just for aid, but for trade and development that actually helps nations grow and empowers Africans for the long term. As President, I've made it clear that the United States is determined to be a partner in Africa's success, a good partner, an equal partner, and a partner for the long term. We don't look to Africa simply. We don't look to Africa simply for its natural resources. We recognize Africa for its greatest resource, which is its people and its talents and their potential. We don't simply want to extract minerals from the ground for our, our growth. We want to build genuine partnerships that create jobs and opportunity for all our peoples, and that unleash the next era of African growth. That's the kind of partnership America offers. And since I took office, we've stepped up our efforts across the board. More investments in Africa, more trade missions like the one Penny led this year, and more support for U.S. exports. And I'm proud. I'm proud that American exports to Africa have grown to record levels supporting jobs in Africa and the United States, including a quarter of a million good American jobs. But here's the thing. That our entire trade with all of Africa is still only about equal to our trade with Brazil, one country. Of all the goods we export to the world, only about 1 percent goes to sub-Saharan Africa. So we've got a lot of work to do. We have to do better, much better. I want Africans buying more American products. I want Americans buying more African products. I know you do, too, and that's what you're doing here today. So I'm pleased that, in conjunction with this forum, American companies are announcing major new deals in Africa. Blackstone will invest in African energy projects. Coca-Cola will partner with Africa to bring clean water to its communities. GE will help build African infrastructure. Marriott will build more hotels. All told, American companies, many with our trade assistance, are announcing new deals in clean energy, aviation, banking, and construction worth more than $14 billion, spurring development across Africa and selling more goods stamped with that proud label made in America. And I don't want to just sustain this momentum. I want to up it. I want to, I want to up our game. So today I'm announcing a series of steps to take our trade with Africa to the next level. First, we're going to keep working to renew the African Growth and Opportunity Act and enhance it.
We still do the vast majority of our trade with just three countries, South Africa, Nigeria, and Angola. It's still heavily weighted towards the energy sector. We need more Africans, including women and small and medium-sized businesses, getting their goods to market. And leaders in Congress, Democrats and Republicans, have said they want to move forward. So I'm optimistic we can work with Congress to renew and modernize AGOA before it expires, renew it for the long term. We need to get that done. Second, as part of our Doing Business in Africa campaign, we're going to do even more to help American companies compete. We'll put even more of our teams on the ground advocating on behalf of your companies. We're going to send even more trade missions. Today, we're announcing $7 billion in new financing to promote American exports to Africa. Earlier today, I signed an executive order to create a new President's Advisory Council of business leaders to help make sure we're doing every single thing we can to help you do business in Africa. And I would be remiss if I did not add that uh, House Republicans can help by reauthorizing the Export-Import Bank. That is the right thing to do. I was trying to explain to somebody that uh, if I've got a Ford dealership and the Toyota dealership is providing financing to anybody who walks in the dealership and I'm not, I'm going to lose business. It's pretty straightforward. We need to get that reauthorized. And you business leaders can help make clear that it is critical to U.S. business. Number three, we want to partner with Africa to build the infrastructure that economies need to flourish. And that starts with electricity, which most Africans still lack. And that's why last year, while traveling throughout the continent, I announced a bold initiative, Power Africa, to double access to electricity in sub-Saharan Africa and help bring electricity to more than 20 million African homes and businesses. Now, we've joined with African governments, the African Development Bank, and the private sector. And I will tell you, the response has exceeded our projections. It has been overwhelming. Already, projects and negotiations are underway that, when completed, will put us nearly 80 percent of the way toward our goal. On top of the significant resources we've already committed, I'm announcing that the United States will increase our pledge to $300 million a year for this effort. And as of today, including an additional $12 billion in new commitments being announced this week by our private sector partners and the World Bank and the government of Sweden, we've now mobilized a total of more than $26 billion to power Africa, just since we announced it, $26 billion. So, so today we're raising the bar. We decided we're, we, we, we're uh, meeting our goal too easily, Zuma. So we've got to go up. So we're tripling our goal, aiming to bring electricity to more than 60 million African homes and businesses that can spark growth for decades to come. Fourth, we'll do more to help Africans trade with each other because the markets with the greatest potential are often the countries right next door. And it should not be harder to export your goods to your neighbor than it is to export those goods to Los Angeles or to Amsterdam. So, so through our Trade Africa initiative, we'll increase our investments to help our African partners build their own capacity to trade, to strengthen regional markets, make borders more efficient, modernize the custom system, we want to get African goods moving faster within Africa as well as outside of Africa. And finally, we're doing more to empower the next generation of African entrepreneurs and business leaders. It's young men and women like our extraordinary Mandela Washington fellows that I met last week. And, and I have to say to the uh, heads of state and government, you would have been extraordinarily proud to meet these young people. Uh, who exhibit so much talent and so much energy and so much drive. With new regional leadership centers and online courses, we're going to offer training and networking for tens of thousands of young entrepreneurs across Africa. New grants will help them access the capital they need to grow 
Our annual Global Entrepreneurship Summit this year will be held in Morocco. Next year it will be held for the first time in Sub-Saharan Africa. Because we want to make sure that all that talent is tapped and they have access to the capital and the, the networks and the markets that they need to succeed. Because if they succeed, then the countries in which they live will succeed. They'll create jobs. They'll create growth. They'll create opportunity. So the bottom line is the United States is making a major and long-term investment in Africa's progress. And taking together the new commitments I've described today across our government and by our many partners total some $33 billion. And that will support development across Africa and jobs here in the United States. Include uh, up to tens of thousands of American jobs are supported every time we expand trade with Africa. As critical as all these investments are, uh, the key to unlocking the next era of African growth is not going to be here in the United States. It's going to be in Africa. And so during this week's summit, uh, we'll be discussing a whole range of areas where we're going to have to work together, areas that are important in their own right, but which are also essential to Africa's growth. Capital is one thing. Development programs and projects are one thing. But, but rule of law, regulatory reform, good governance, those things matter even more because people should be able to start a business and ship their goods without having to pay a bribe or hire somebody's cousin. Agricultural development is critical because it's the best way to boost incomes for the majority of Africans who are farmers, especially as they deal with the impacts of climate change. Rebuilding a strong health infrastructure, especially for mothers and children, is critical because no country can prosper unless its citizens are healthy and strong and children are starting off uh, with the advantages they need uh, to grow to their full potential. And we're going to have to talk about security and peace because the future belongs to those who build, not those who destroy. And it's very hard to attract business investment, and it's very hard to build infrastructure, and it's very hard to sustain entrepreneurship in the midst of conflict. So I just want to close with one example of what trade can help us build together. Uh, Kusum Kavia was born in Kenya. Her family was originally from India. Eventually, she emigrated to the United States and, along with her husband, started a small business in California. Uh, it started off as a small engineering firm. Then it started manufacturing small power generators. With the help of Export-Import Bank, including seminars and a line of credit and risk insurance, uh, they started exporting power generators to West Africa. In Benin, they helped build a new electric power plant. And it's ended up being a win-win for everybody. It's been a win for their company, Combustion Associates, because exports to Africa have boosted their sales, which means they've been able to hire more workers here in the United States. They partner with GE. GE is doing well. Most of their revenues are from exports to Africa. It's been a win for their suppliers in Texas and Ohio and New York. It's been a win for Benin and its people because more electricity for families and businesses, jobs for Africans uh, at the power plant because the company hires locally and trains those workers. And they hope to keep expanding as part of the, our Power Africa initiative. So this, this is an example of just one small business. Imagine if we can replicate that success across our countries. Kusum says, when our customers see the label made in America, when they see our flag, it puts us above all the competition. And her vision for their company is the same vision that brings us all here today. She says, we really want to have a long-term partnership with Africa. So Kasum is here. Uh, I had a chance to meet her backstage. She's, uh, where is she? Right there. Stand up, Kasum. Uh, so she's doing great work. Thank you so much. But, but she's an example of what's possible, a long-term partnership with Africa. And that's what America offers. That's what we're building. That's the difference we can make when Africans and Americans work together. So let's follow Kasum's lead.
Let's do even more business together. Let's tear down barriers that slow us down and get in the way of trade. Let's build up the infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, the ports, the electricity that connect our countries. Let's create more and sell more and buy more from each other. I'm confident that we can, and when we do, we won't just propel the next era of African growth. We'll create more jobs and opportunity for everybody, for people here in the United States and for people around the world. So thank you very much, everybody, for what so far has been an outstanding session. And I've got the opportunity to speak to this young man. So thank you very much, Mr. President, for this opportunity. Um, I'll start by wishing you a belated happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, have, have you introduced yourself to everybody? Um, I wanted to really jump into the Yeah, go issues. ahead and introduce right, yourself. So anyway. Come on. You. Um, I'm Takunde Chingonzo. I'm a young entrepreneur. I'm, I'm 21. I'm from Zimbabwe. And I'm working in the uh, wireless technology space. We're essentially liberating the internet for Zimbabweans. So, and, then, and, and let me just, uh, uh, this is an example of our young African leaders. In fact, the youngest young African leader. Uh, but uh, one thing I will say, though, you know, if, uh, if you're going to promote your business, you've got to make sure to let people know. <laughs> definitely, you know? definitely. <laughs> just a little tip. Definitely. Yeah, you can't be shy, man. <laughs> Please that's, go ahead. That's, that's correct, Mr. President. So, I was really going to start by uh, delving into a personal experience. I was going to get to my business and how I got to where we are. Um, so as I was saying, we're working in the technology space. Um, I'm working on my third startup. It's called SciSci. We're creating Zimbabwe's first free internet access network, uh, hence liberating the internet. Um, so in our working, um, we came to a point in time where we needed to uh, import a bit of technology from the you know, United States. And so we were engaging in a conversation with these US-based um, businesses. And the response that we got time and time again was that, um, unfortunately, we cannot do business with you because you're from Zimbabwe. And you know, I was shocked. You know, This doesn't make sense. And so this is the exact same experience that other you know, entrepreneurs that are in Zimbabwe have gone through. Even through the meet, uh, meetings that I've had here, you, know, you sit down with potential investors. You talk about the, the project, the outlook, the opportunity, you know, the growth, and all that. And they're excited. You can see. You know, all systems are firing, right? And then I say I'm from Zimbabwe, and they look at me and they say, uh, young man, um, this is a good project, very good, very good, but unfortunately we cannot engage uh, in business with you. And I understand that the sanctions that we have as Zimbabwe, um, uh, that are imposed on entities in Zimbabwe, these are targeted sanctions, right? But then we've come to a point in time where we as young Africans are failing to you know, properly engage in business with US-based entities because there hasn't been that clarity. These right. entities believe that Zimbabwe is under sanctions. So what really can we do to try and clarify this to make sure that we as the young uh, entrepreneurs can effectively develop Africa and engage in business? Well, obviously, uh, the situation in, in Zimbabwe is somewhat unique. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge for us uh, in the United States uh, has been how do we balance uh, our desire to help the people of Zimbabwe mm -hmm. uh, with uh, what has frankly been a repeated uh, violation of basic uh, de democratic practices uh, and human rights inside of Zimbabwe. Uh, and you know, we think it is very important to send clear signals about uh, how we expect elections to be conducted and governments to be conducted uh, because if we don't, then uh, all too often, uh, with impunity, uh, the people of those countries can suffer. But you're absolutely right that it also has to be balanced with uh, making sure that whatever structures uh, that we put in place uh, with respect to sanctions don't end up punishing uh, the very people inside those countries. Uh, my immediate suggestion, uh, and this is a, a broader uh, point uh, to all uh, the African businesses who are here, as well as the U.S. businesses, uh, is to make sure that we're using the Department of Commerce uh, and the other U.S. Uh, agencies uh, where we can gather groups of entrepreneurs uh, and find out exactly what can be done, what can't be done, what resources are available. Um, it may be that 
uh, you and a group of uh, entrepreneurs in Zimbabwe uh, are able to meet with us and propose uh, certain uh, projects that uh, allow, uh, allow us to say, uh, this is something that will advance as opposed to retard uh, the, the progress uh, for the Zimbabwean people. So uh, what I'd suggest would be that uh, you know, we, uh, we set up a meeting and uh, we, we find out uh, what kinds of things the, the young entrepreneurs in Zimbabwe want to do uh, and see if there are ways that we can work with you consistent with uh, the strong message that we send about good governance uh, in Zimbabwe. I see. Yeah, because the, the, really, the point of emphasis really is that um, as young Africans, we want to converse with other business right. entities here in the U.S. Right. And if these sanctions are really targeted, then in honest truth, they aren't supposed to hamper uh, the business that we're trying to engage in, the right. development well, that we're talking we'll, about. Let's see if we can uh, uh, refine them further based on some of the things you're, you're talking about. No, that's, that's all right. Um, now, there have been a good number of um, you know, investments that have been uh, announced here, you know, multi-billion dollar investments in Africa, and we are really, you know, excited. And there's been a lot of talk about how, you know, the public and private partnerships are the vehicle through which this investment will come into Africa. But I really want to bring you to a point of clarity. I believe that the private sector is stratified in itself. We have the existing, you know, um, indigenous businesses in these countries that we are hoping to invest in. Um, and this is where usually the funding comes through, the partnerships and all that, and that is well and fine. But then Underneath that, we have these young upcoming entrepreneurs, uh, the innovators, you know, those that come up with products and services that disrupt the industry. And this is the innovation that we want in Africa, to build products by Africans for Africans. But in most cases, and what we've seen over the past years is that, indeed, this investment comes through, but it never cascades down to these um, you know, younger entrepreneurs, the emerging businesses. And so the existing businesses then form a, a sort of ceiling which we cannot break through. When it comes to investment, when, you, when you're talking about uh, solving unemployment, I would believe that it's more realistic to um, assume and understand that the probability of 10 startups employing 10 people in a given time period, it's more realistic than one indigenous company employing 100 people. So what really has been, or rather, has there been any consideration in these deals that have been structured in the investments that you announced to cater for the young entrepreneur who's trying to innovate to solve you know, the problems in society? Well, first of all, I think uh, for, for the business leaders who are here, both African and, and uh, U.S., mm -hmm. um, it's hard being a startup everywhere. That's true. Because the, part of what you're describing uh, is typical of, of business around the world. Uh, folks who are already in, they don't necessarily want to share. They don't want to be disrupted. Uh, if there's a good opportunity, <laughs> they'd rather do it themselves. <laughs> if they see a small, up-and-coming hotshot uh, who might disrupt their business, uh, you know, they may initially try to block you, or they may, or, or they may try to buy you out. Or, uh, you know, so, and getting financing for a startup is always going to be difficult. You, you hear that from uh, entrepreneurs here in the U.S. as well. Sure. Having said that, mm -hmm. what is absolutely true is that uh, as we think about the billions of dollars that we're mobilizing. We want to make sure that small businesses, medium-sized businesses, women-owned businesses, that they have opportunity. And so my instructions to all of our agencies, and hopefully the work that we're doing with all of our partners, is how can we identify, uh, target uh, financing for the startup? How can we identify and, and link up U.S. companies with small and medium-sized businesses and not just the large businesses. Uh, and I think you are absolutely right that uh, by us uh, trying to spread investment, uh -huh. uh, not narrowly through one or two companies, but more broadly, uh -huh. that the opportunities for success in those countries are higher. Uh, and it also creates a healthy competition. Um, and, and, and that's true also in terms of how we're uh, designing, uh, for example, uh, our, our uh, Feed the Future program, uh -huh. which is working with almost two million small farmers inside of Africa. Mm -hmm. When I was in uh, Senegal, uh, I met with a, uh, a woman 
maybe in her, uh, in her 30s. Mm -hmm. She had a small plot of land initially. Uh, through the Feed the Future program, she had been able to mechanize, double her productivity. Mm -hmm. By doubling her productivity and through a smartphone, getting better prices to the market, she was able to increase her profits. Then she bought a tractor. Then she doubled her productivity again. And suddenly what had started off as just a program to increase her income mm -hmm. had become capital for a growing business where she was now hiring people in her area mm -hmm. uh, and doing some of the processing of the grain that she grew herself so that she could move up the value chain. There are entrepreneurs like that all across Africa. Sometimes the capital they need is not very large. Sometimes very it's true. a fairly modest amount. Uh, and so what, what I want to do is to make sure that we are constantly looking out for opportunities to uh, disperse this capital, uh, not just narrowly, but broadly. And one of the things that I hope happens with U.S. companies is, is that they're constantly looking for opportunities uh, to partner with uh, young entrepreneurs, startups, and not just always going to the, uh, uh, the same uh, well-established businesses. Now, there, there are going to be some large capital projects right. where yeah. Uh, you know, you've got a good, solid, established company. Hopefully, they themselves have policies with respect to their suppliers mm -hmm. that allow them uh, to start uh, encouraging and growing small businesses as well. Exactly. And on that note, um, I'm glad that you acknowledged that. And I hope that even in these deals, in the investments that we're talking about, that one of the conditions be that those large uh, organizations that are getting investment have policies that cascade downwards to people at the grassroots. Um, you spoke about this lady who was using a smartphone to, you know, um, it is one key issue that is really propelling business and development in Africa, the ability to leverage technology. Yep. And really it is all about the Internet of Things, and that is why I'm personally working in liberating the Internet, to get more people connected. Now, there is this, um, and, you know, this is the huge opportunity in Africa as well. Now, there's this troubling um, issue, rather, that has been brought to our attention, uh, we have entities and organizations that have come up and that have said, you know, we want to control the Internet. We want to uh, see who gets what traffic and from whom. Right. And see, policies and um, activities like that uh, become challenges for startups that are trying to leverage the Internet. For this lady, this farmer that you talked about, right. who's trying to leverage and get information right. uh, from the Internet. So I wanted to understand what is your stance on net neutrality and its effects in the growth and development in Africa? Well, I, I, th this is an important issue for all heads of state and government, not just in Africa, but around the world. Mm -hmm. The reason the Internet is so powerful yes. is because it's open. Yes. My, my daughters, 16 and 13, mm -hmm. they can access information mm -hmm. from any place in the world. Mm -hmm. They can learn about uh, a particular discipline mm -hmm. uh, instantaneously in ways that when I was their age, first of all, I wasn't as motivated as they are. I, mean, I, was, <laughs> I, I was lazier than, I, uh, than that, but uh, they do much better in school than I do. But, but they can, uh, the world's at their fingertips. And what facilitates that and what has facilitated the incredible value that's been built by companies like Google and, and Facebook and uh, you know, so many others all the applications that you find on your smartphone is that there are not uh, restrictions, there are not barriers to entry mm -hmm. for new companies who have a good idea to use this platform that is open uh, to create value. Mm -hmm. And it is very important, I think, that we maintain that. Now, uh, I, I know that there's a tension in some countries. Their attitude is we don't necessarily want all this information flowing because it can end up also being used as a tool for uh, political organizing. It can be used for, uh, a, a, as a tool uh, to uh, criticize the government. And so maybe we'd prefer a system that is more closed. Uh, I think that is a self-defeating attitude. I, I, mm -hmm. Over the long term, because of technology, information, Knowledge, mm -hmm. transparency is inevitable. And that's true here in the United States. It's true everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we should be doing is trying to maintain 
an open internet, trying to keep uh, a process whereby uh, any talented person who has an idea can use, suddenly use the internet to disperse information. There are going to be occasional tensions involved in terms of us uh, monitoring the use of uh, the internet for uh, terrorist networks or uh, you know, criminal enterprises or human trafficking, but we can do that in ways that are compatible with maintaining an open internet. Uh, and, and this raises the broader question that I had mentioned earlier, which is uh, Africa needs capital. In some cases, Africa needs technical assistance. Africa certainly needs access to markets. But perhaps the biggest thing that Africa is going to need to unleash the, even more the potential that's already there and the growth that's already taking place is uh, laws and regulations and, 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 and structures mm -hmm. that empower individuals and are not simply designed to control uh, or empower those at the very top. And uh, the Internet's one example. You've got to have uh, a, a system and, and uh, sets of laws that encourage entrepreneurship, but that's also true when it comes to uh, a whole a host of issues. Uh, it's true when it comes to how hard it is it to get a business permit uh, when uh, a new startup like yours uh, wants to uh, uh, you know, uh, establish itself. When it comes to Power Africa, there, is, there are billions of dollars floating around the world that are interested in investing in power generation in Africa. Mm -hmm. And the countries that are going to attract that investment are the ones where the investor knows that if a power plant is built, that there are rules in place that are transparent that ensure that they're going to get a decent return. And that some of the revenue isn't siphoned off in certain ways uh, so that the investor has political risks uh, or uh, uh, risks with respect to corruption. The more that governments set up the right rules, understanding that in the 21st century, uh, the power that drives uh, growth and development in the marketplace uh, involves knowledge, uh, and that can't be controlled, mm -hmm. the more successful countries are going to be. I see. Um, so just to clarify on the issue of the net neutrality, yeah. you're advocating for an open and fair internet, yeah. um, which within it has structure to ensure that the platform in itself isn't abused. Well, there, there, there are two issues. Net neutrality, yeah. uh, in the United States, one of the issues around net neutrality is whether you are creating different uh, rates or charges mm -hmm. for different content providers. That's uh -huh. the big controversy here. Yes, that's right? right. So you have big, wealthy media companies who might be willing to uh, pay more, but then also charge more for more spectrum, more bandwidth on the internet, so they can stream movies faster or what have you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I personally, the position of my administration, as well as I think a lot of companies here is, you don't want to start getting a, a differentiation in how uh, accessible the internet is to various users. Mm -hmm. You want to leave it open so that the next Google or the next Facebook can succeed. Uh, the, there's another problem, though. It, there are other countries, and I, I think this is what you're alluding to, that feel comfortable with the idea of controlling and censoring mm -hmm. internet uh, content mm -hmm. in their home countries mm -hmm. and setting up rules and laws about what can or cannot be on the, on the internet. Uh, and I think that that not only is, is uh, going to inhibit entrepreneurs who are creating value on the internet, I think it's also uh, going to inhibit the growth of the country generally because closed societies that, uh, that are not open to new ideas, eventually they fall behind. Mm -hmm. Eventually they miss out on uh, uh, the future because they're so locked into uh, trying to maintain uh, the past. I see. Um, thank you for the clarity. Um, I think because we're out of a bit of time, uh, I'll ask my, my final question. 
Uh, when we began this conversation, uh, we were alluding to the fact that there is need to separate the political function and economic function. In other words, politics should not get in the way of business, right? And I've gone to quite a good number of, I know it's difficult, um, so I've gone to a, a good number of conferences where the end deliverable of the entire uh, summit or whatever it is, is that we need to lobby government uh, to create policies that are conducive in this and that. And that's usually what you get. We are either, either you know, trying to lobby somebody to do something, right? And in turn, governments come up and say, yes, we promise uh, to come up with this and that and this and that. And that's a whole you know, political sphere of things. My question is, apart from uh, that, what can we as business leaders, as the private sector, what can we do um, sort of independently to, to, what can we do to create this economic environment that fosters for the growth and development of Africa as a continent? Well, uh, look, uh, although this isn't always uh, a popular position uh, here in Washington these days, the truth is, is that government really can help set the conditions and the framework for markets to function effectively, um, in part because governments uh, are able to initiate projects like roads and bridges and airports that any individual business mm -hmm. would find cost prohibitive. It, it, it wouldn't make sense to invest in uh, what is a collective good. Mm -hmm. It's not going to help your bottom line if everybody else is using it. Right? So that's part of the function of government. Part of the function of government is to educate a population so that you've got a well-trained workforce. Uh, it, it's hard for companies to invest in doing that by themselves. Um, there, there are certain common goods like maintaining clean air and clean water and making sure that uh, you know, if you have capital markets that they're well regulated so that they're trustworthy and small investors and large investors know that if they invest uh, in uh, a stock uh, that they're not being cheated. So there, there are a whole host of functions that government has to play. Uh, but in the end, what drives innovation typically is not what happens in government, it's what's, what's happening uh, in companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we found in the United States is, is that companies, once they've got the basic rules and they've got the basic platform, uh, they are able to create value and innovation and cultures that encourage growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that African entrepreneurs are going to be the trendsetters mm -hmm. it, for determining how societies think about themselves and ultimately how governments uh, 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 think about these issues. The, the, the truth of the matter is, is that if you have big success, successful companies or you've got widespread entrepreneurship and you have a growing middle class, and uh, practices have been established in terms of uh, you know, fair dealing and treating your workers properly and uh, uh, extending opportunity to smaller contractors and promoting women uh, and making sure that women are paid like men. Uh, and suddenly what happens is businesses create new norms and, and new sensibilities. And governments oftentimes will respond. Uh, and so I think in Africa, uh, what I'd like to see more and more of is partnerships between American businesses, between African businesses, uh, some of the uh, incredible cultures of some of our US businesses that do a really good job promoting people and uh, maintaining a meritocracy and, and uh, treating women equally and, and, and treating, uh, you know, uh, people of different races and faiths and sexual orientations fairly and equally, uh, and making sure that there, there are typical norms of, of how you deal with, with people in contracts and, and uh, uh, re respect uh, uh, legal constraints. All those things, uh, I think, can then take root in a country like Zimbabwe or any other country. Hopefully, governments are encouraging that, not inhibiting that. They recognize that that's how the world as a whole is increasingly moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and over time, you will see an, an, an Africa uh, that is driven by individual entrepreneurs and private organizations 
and governments will be responsive to uh, their demands. Uh, so uh, I, I think the one thing I, I want to make sure people understand, though, is it's not an either-or issue. Government has a critical role to play. The marketplace has a critical role to play. Non, uh, uh, Nonprofit organizations have a critical role to play. Uh, but the goal and, and the orientation constantly should be how do we empower individuals to work together? Mm -hmm. And if, if we are empowering young people like you all across Africa, if we've got a 21-year-old who's already started three businesses, uh, you know, we've got to figure out how to invest in him, how to make it easier for him to succeed. If you succeed, you're going to then be hiring a whole bunch of people, and they in turn will succeed. Uh, and that's been the recipe for growth uh, in the 20th century and the 21st century. Uh, and I'm confident that uh, Africa is well on its way. America just wants to make sure that we're helpful in that process. And I know that all the U.S. companies who are here, uh, that's their goal as well. Uh, you know, we, we are interested in Africa uh, because we know that if Africa thrives and succeeds, and if you've got a, a bunch of entrepreneurs they're going to need supplies from us, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or they may supply us with outstanding products. They're going to have a growing middle class that wants to buy iPhones or uh, you know, applications from us. In turn, they may provide us new services, and we can be the distributor for something that's invented in Africa. That's and right. all of us grow at the same, at time. The same time. That's our goal. Uh, and I'm confident that we can make it happen. And this uh, summit's been a great start. So I want to thank you for uh, doing a great job moderating. I want to thank all the leaders here, uh, not only of government, but also business for participating. Uh, there's been great energy, great enthusiasm. Uh, I know a lot of business has gotten done. Uh, if any of you are interested in investing in this young man, let him know. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you very much. All right. Appreciate it. through music. I hope to create a film funding company that would take the craft of our African filmmakers and our writers and produce it into something that's worth a worldwide audience. My dream is to become a chef and maybe one day open a restaurant. I would like to start a finance company. I want to be specialized in shale gases in Algeria. To get rich? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I'd like to combine my fashion, drawing, and blogging skills to create an online business. I would like to see African fashion, African art go international. So I want to teach people about bees, teach them how to bee farm, how to look after the environment. I want to create a company which will be able to assist people from poor backgrounds who are not able to afford uh, health care. We want to create some apps, some platforms, some online platforms that will help people improving those ideas and turning them into reality. My dream is to be an artist so I can incorporate my art and the informatics into one by having galleries that show electronic versions of my art. I would think of the Empire State Building. If I could create like holographs into the sky, that would be awesome. The future is very bright.